You are now listening to Bigfoot and Beyond, featuring the OG bad boys of Bigfoot, the Dr. Heckle and Mr. Jive of Squatchology, the Chip and Dale of Bigfoot, and I'm not talking about the cartoon. Please welcome your hosts, the Bigfoot celebrity couple, Biff Clobo, better known as Cliff Berrickman and James Bobo Fay. Hey, Cliff. Hey, Bobo. How you doing today? Good. How you doing? I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. Everything's kind of uh, par for the course here at the museum. Pretty slow, um, being the off season and all that stuff, but we're surviving. But who cares about that? I think what people really want to know about is your on-site investigation from last week. Well, first of all, tell, tell people what happened. How, what did you hear about? Um, and uh, what, what was the circumstance that brought you out there? I got a call from a guy that was out in Willow Creek. And he said he just was at the store and he ran into a guy that had just saw one like driving to Willow Creek coming down the hill from Horse Mountain. And I, so I went out there. Um, I got there about two and a half, three hours into the sighting. Anyways, they were, they were pretty excited. Only one of the witnesses was there of the two. They showed me where they saw it, and there was definitely a disturbance. But where the thing had been walking was super thick leaf litter, um, a lot of oaks, just and madrone, and a, a lot of just stuff. And you could see where it was torn up, and there were some longer steps it looked like. But I mean, there was bears coming through there, elk, deer, pigs. They got pigs out there now, wild pigs. Oh no! Yes, yeah, so they're doing a lot of they're they're. Uh, there was too many mountain lions and bears for them before, but they've kind of broken through the redwood curtain, and now we got them up there. So yeah, it was it was, uh, it was getting stormy, and um, I looked around. I couldn't find anything definitive, and they wanted me to hang out. And I, I was there for like several hours, and then I came back about a midnight or something. I just was like, yeah, I don't think this is going to get me to get out here, but. It's good to know that there's one, you know, whenever you get, uh, for sure. Well, I mean, as far as I can tell, they're for pretty for sure. Cause they'd had, uh, stuff happening over the past couple of weeks, but I got a new, I got access to a new spot for this winter where a major elk herd over winters on a 700 acre ranch. Uh, I got access, I got access to that. Oh, very good. So did that, that, so two good things happened this past week. So you, even though you didn't walk away with any footprints or hair samples or any hard evidence like that, you have another dot on the map um, to kind of start forming more patterns for Horse Mountain and then a new location that has some possibilities for Sasquatches uh, during the winter time. Yeah, because that was one of my first places uh, was Horse Mountain when I was going a lot in the uh, late 80s and to the late 90s. Horse Mountain was one of my go to spots and they're, they're definitely out there. Yeah. And of course for listeners thinking, Oh, I'm going to go to horse mountain. Uh, be careful. There's a lot of cartel presence on that hill. Um, I wouldn't go out there. Uh, anybody just in some fool listening to this thinking, Oh, there's a Bigfoot. I'm going to go out there and check it out. Don't be dumb. Don't be foolish. Uh, don't mess around with, uh, people out there doing nefarious activities. Um, just stay away. There's plenty of Bigfoots in places that are easily, easily accessible. So that's my advice. Well, on to to more cheerful things. I'm pretty excited about today's episode. Yeah, we got a legend coming on the podcast today. He's been in the field for literally 60 years since he was, you know, just a teenager. Um, He's the most prolific writer on cryptozoology in the history of the world. No one's written more books than this guy. Uh, He's got a wide breadth of knowledge. I mean, he knows about Bigfoot, but he's definitely into the beyond. I mean, this guy, we couldn't have a better guest for this show. And it's our good friend and uh, fellow crypto enthusiast, Lauren Coleman. Yeah, Lauren, welcome to the show. And thank you so much for setting aside a little bit of time today for, for just the little folks, Bobo and I. We really, really do appreciate it. Oh, come on. You know, you guys are very important in the field. And I'm just a little guy that grew up. So that's what <laughs> happens. I suppose, you know, I've said it before on here and a friend, my friend of mine once told me that like cryptozoology or Bigfoot or whatever is, is kind of neat because it's one of those uh, fields where your idols can become your friends. And I think uh, speaking for Bobo and I, I feel safe speaking for Bobo on this one. This is one of those cases. The fact that uh, like Lauren Coleman, like he's my friend. I mean, uh, I, I would have never thought such a thing could come true 20 or 25 years ago when I first started this. Um, so it's a thr- I know I can talk to you at any time, but it's a thrill to be talking to you on the podcast. So thanks so much. Well, it's great being on here. I mean, it is interesting. I would have to butt right up against uh, the dead people on Horse Mountain and stuff. But that's a kind of interesting uh, phenomena. So uh, 
It is intriguing to me, as you were saying the whole story, uh, Bobo, that in the beginning, when Jerry Crew and all of those folks were uh, dealing with the Wallace hoaxes and stuff like that, people were saying they created Bigfoot because they wanted to scare people away from their construction site. And it's interesting nowadays that uh, Bigfoot is very real in the area that you guys investigate, and there's another illegal activity going on there. Many people thought that Wallace and those folks weren't really doing their job when they were constructing roads, and they were trying to really hide the fact that they were cheating people out of money by creating these stories of Bigfoot. Well, it turns out Bigfoot was uh, real probably and has lived on way long beyond uh, the construction of that road and, and these people that have passed away. No, Lauren, you, you have, I mean, I, I don't mean it to be disrespectful at all, but you have the, uh, you have the perspective of age with you now. You know, that's a nice way of saying it, isn't it? But because of that, you have met so many people over the decades. Um, Did you meet uh, Ray Wallace or Jerry Crew or any of those early people from the very beginning? Well, I did talk to Ray Wallace on the phone and interviewed him quite a bit and tracked him down. And uh, but I I got to meet people like, uh, you know, and talk to Ivan Sanderson and Bernard Hoyvelmans and John Green way back before anybody really knew about them. About when did you cross paths with, like, say, Sanderson for the first time? Well, I got involved in March of 1960 with cryptozoology, and I started talking to Sanderson as soon as his book came out. I actually took his book, uh, Abominable Snowman, Legend Come to Life, um, when it came out in 1961, and I very uh, carefully went page by page and organized it according to everybody's proper name, and I got in touch with them, either through letters, through telephone, or through meeting them. And uh, the first year after I'd read that book, I had 400 correspondents around around the world, literally. So uh, I, I got to meet them. I remember writing a letter to John Green and um, said, you know, would you help me with this information? And he's, he wrote me back and he said, you seem to be about the age of my son, so I, I'll go ahead and talk to you. <laughs> you know, years later, we met at conferences in Idaho and California and British Columbia. And in many ways, like you, I, I really put John Green up on a pedestal and was very um, privileged and honored to uh, got to know him and actually turned out to involve him more and more in my books. We got to know John Green fairly well. I spent a lot. I've been to his house and you know socialized with him quite a bit. But I mean, uh, Ivan Sanderson to me. I mean that for people that don't know who that is, he wrote the. He's the OG guy. Him and Bernard Huvelmans, they're the two guys that set set the tone and set the set everything for uh, the for the world of cryptozoology. What was Ivan like? Because I mean, I've I've always been super fascinated by him. I never got to meet him or speak to him. I've never even really seen an interview with him, I don't think. Well, he was very much uh, a Scottish individual who uh, came to America many years before he settled down and he uh, he actually uh, died um, in, what, 73. But he he had a whole hidden part of him. He was a a member of British intelligence and uh, knew a lot of people in the Navy intelligence in the United States, but... uh, he actually went on his first expedition when he was 17 years old uh, by himself and uh, to Africa. And I, I was very, uh, you know, kind of enamored of the fact that he got to travel to all these places and, and saw all these people. And then he decided to settle down and uh, let's say he got more fringe, you know, more open attitude about UFOs and Fortiana and, different things like that. The guy that really struck me uh, actually decided, I decided to um, move to California in 74 and 75. 
and got to meet George Haas and Jim McLaren. And then all of a sudden, one day I got a call and this guy wanted to come down and see me in my apartment in San Francisco. It was Rene de Hinden. Huh. And he, he just, he, he, you know, spent the whole day with me asking questions and me asking him questions. And uh, I just was very uh, startled by the fact he would find me in the middle of San Francisco. So uh, he was a great guy. And uh, I was a- able to meet his uh, ex-wife at uh, John Green's tribute. Um, but de Hinden was an important person in the field. Sometimes I think he was um, didn't get enough praise because he hadn't written any enough books. But uh, despite that, I knew he was in the field and talking to people. And he was a gruff old character, but uh, something special to me. Who impressed you the most of those uh, original, like old timer guys? Who who'd you when you spoke to them, they they struck you as the most knowledgeable and maybe like like real high IQ that sort of thing. DeHinden had a real common man sense about him. Uh, Ivan Sanderson was extremely intelligent, very bright. Hoivelmans, of course, knew kind of like I've grown to be. He knew a lot about a lot of cryptids all over the world. Uh, He also loved women. Uh, He would vacation on an island and surround himself with beautiful women. He was an early kind of... uh, mid-century modern romantic zoologist, and and he certainly lived that life quite well. You know, I, I should have brought my list of all the people I met because it just was so many, and I was, uh, so many had passed on now. It's it's sad, but uh, I, you're right. I, I am so old now. I'm, uh, I'm 73, but for 60 years I've been involved in it. I've met so many people that I can't even uh, remember sometimes all the people uh, I've met. And I I was very happy whenever you two uh, brought the whole crew to Maine because that was, a, that was a really great time. For those listening, Lauren runs the International Cryptozoology Museum in Portland, Maine. And it's it was in the show. It's, it's a great spot. If you're anywhere in New England, you got to check it out. Yeah, anywhere at all in the, like the northeast corner of the United States, not just New England. Like if, I'd say if you're in Pennsylvania, go make the trek. Um, it, it, you will not be disappointed. And, and you know, every, everybody who listens to the podcast knows that I've opened up a Bigfoot museum. And really, I'm standing on Lauren's shoulders. You know, Lauren and a few other people um, throughout the U.S. who have like delved into this sort of crypto tourism thing. Um, it, yeah, okay, you can bring the kids and have a good time, but museums like Lauren's, especially serves such a big purpose of preserving the history of cryptozoology in general um, with, with uh, letters and artifacts and just information, passing it down. Because like it or not, and Lauren, I'd like to get your thoughts on this. We're, we've entered this new age of cryptozoology where most, I'm, I'm going to venture and say most, I could be wrong on that. I hope I'm wrong. But it seems that most of the people who are interested in it get their information from Facebook and YouTube and really doubtful sources instead of going right to the source, which to me means books written by the people doing the research. Um, and museums like Lauren's uh, help everyone by preserving those earlier records because, man, just don't get your Bigfoot information from YouTube or, or even reality shows. Just don't do it. You're cheating yourself out of an education. Do you have any thoughts on that, Lauren? Oh, definitely. I, uh, the whole mission of the museum was I, I came to the realization that uh, I've been collecting this stuff for 50 years and I had to face the fact that I'm uh, going to die. That if I wanted to make sure that my material from you know Jimmy Stewart's letter to pieces of the Yeti uh, samples from the 1959 expedition, um, all these pictures and casts and artifacts and tourist art and native art that I had collected, if I was going to make sure that I had would save it from eBay and from the auction and from somebody uh, just taking it and throwing it away, like I'd heard so many stories, that I was going to have to create a museum myself. Uh, and so I did that in 2003. And uh, when you guys came in 2015, we were in a, a, a large space. But even since then, 
Uh, we moved to Thompson's Point in Portland, Maine, uh, another section, and we've expanded uh, three times to the size it was over on Avon Street. So we're just getting donations. Uh, my whole model was, uh, as opposed to it being thrown away or auctioned off, find a place to donate it to your university, to your alumni, to your local historical society, as opposed to losing that legacy, losing those artifacts. We need to preserve it. So now we have all of these exhibits. A lot of things are in on displays at the museum, but we also have a lot of things in storage in archives. Uh, for instance, we recently got the Sasquatch Revealed exhibit from Chris Murphy uh, that's been traveling all over the country for 15 years. And uh, Chris was tired of doing that. He was tired of uh, dealing with all of these different museums and the requirements and crossing back and forth across the border. So uh, the final resting place of his exhibit and his displays is our museum. And we're fully integrating his, his displays and his artifacts with our artifacts. Uh, just before that, we'd received the uh, uh, material and archives and casts from uh, Tom Page, who, like Tom Slick, uh, was a benefactor during the days of Patterson and uh, Peter Burns expeditions. So a lot of these guys are getting old, they're dying, they're trying to figure out where to put their, their materials. I'm sending anybody on the West Coast to your museum, Cliff, because, you know, they need to donate the closer to home, the better. Um, and, uh, I mean, we got a, a tractor trailer full of material from, uh, from the West Coast, from Chris Murphy. But uh, some of this needs to be spread around the country. You know, the place in Georgia, other places that are getting more established, I think I will trust. I have for many years been um, keeping a, a record of every cryptozoological museum in the world to, to see and hope that they really can do something in terms of, I mean, we're fully sanctioned now by the federal government as a 501c3. And uh, we even, yay, we got our first SBA loan. So, so I feel we're really been sanctioned because we'd been, We'd been going month to month, uh, you know, no donations, just admissions and really scraping along. And uh, I never wanted to go into debt, but this pandemic is making us all look uh, for some help and wherever we can get it. And so we finally did take a loan, but it, it kept us alive and we really want to stay alive. Stay tuned for more Bigfoot and Beyond with Cliff and Bobo. We'll be right back after these messages. Now, Lauren, um, I want to look back uh, to maybe, I don't know, in the 60s, 70s, and probably the 80s, into your field work. Because I, I, I don't think that you perhaps get credit for your field work, because uh, everybody knows you as the author or um, the, the guy talking on TV about whatever cryptids we're talking about at the time on whatever show. But like you've done a fair amount of field work over the years, haven't you? Can you tell us a little bit about some of those times? Yeah, that was uh, one of the early complaints after my books came out. I said, Hey, this guy never gets out in the field. What is the armchair cryptozoologist? You know, so, so I got tired of that. But if you, those people that read my books actually saw that I lived in Illinois. I went to school, undergraduate in Illinois, but I was hardly ever in class. I, I, I hitchhiked all over the Midwest, uh, all the way down to Mississippi. Uh, you know, sometimes out to Arizona, all the way over to the East Coast. So I, uh, even in the days before I owned a, a little pickup truck, uh, I would go to Mississippi and talk to people about the reports of the, the skunk apes. Uh, I picked my university, University of, South, of Southern Illinois, because in Ivan T. Sanderson's book, 
there's stories of the little red men of the woods or the little red men of the swamps. So I went down there, uh, starting from Farmer City all the way down to Carbondale and Murfreesboro and investigated those cases. And remember, this was back before the internet, so I didn't put things quickly online because there was no online. Uh, I I didn't, I, I would keep a file of a story and uh, share it. I, I mentioned in John Green's book, I mentioned in John Keel's book, as that researcher that's out there in the field uh, sending them reports. I, I would start files and name creatures uh, like the, the Farmer City Monster or I investigated the Thunderbirds in Alton, Illinois. So uh, the Dover Demon in Dover, Massachusetts, uh, Phantom Panthers, uh, North American Apes, I'd call them. You know, all over the country, I was investigating creatures, uh, all kinds of different creatures. I often would go into community. I remember one time vividly, I uh, went to Indiana investigating giant turtle reports. And I learned early on, you don't go uh, into a community and say, I'm looking for uh, this kind of creatures because I would usually go into a community and say, are there any strange reports uh, you know, of strange animals, weird out of place animals? And I'd be looking for those turtle reports, but they'd start telling me about phantom kangaroos that were hopping around. And uh, so I'd get new information that I uh, wasn't looking for. You become in this field, you become like an amateur psychologist or psychiatrist. You must have run into a lot of that, didn't you? Oh, yeah. That's why I went on for my master's in psychiatric social work, because I was certainly, I was had degrees in anthropology and zoology. So I, I didn't want to have any criticism that I wasn't also looking in the people's minds, because I used to make up... Uh, a chart for every eyewitness, a psychosocial, you know, what was their background? What were they doing working? Every little detail was important to me because I sometimes found out, uh, you know, in a group of four witnesses, one of them was overly interested in science fiction and had a great fantasy life. Uh, that was fine if I could get confirmation from the other eyewitnesses that what he and they all had seen uh, corresponded. But I, I did that kind of uh, psychological uh, inquiry without really being too obvious about it. And actually, I had a lot of criticism for other investigators that would stand in front of a witness and lead the witness by giving them descriptive material uh, with their leading questions. I thought it was uh, straight out of psychology to, to be very careful and and come to every wit eyewitness with a clean slate. You know, uh, a lot of people might not realize when they listen to this, how awesome Southern Indiana and Southern Illinois are for squatching. I mean, I remember when I first heard that you were, when I was reading your biography, whatever, when I got one of your books, that you went to Illinois, uh, Southern Illinois University. I was thinking like, God, if you're in a big why would you go there? And then, man, I get so, that's one of the top five spots in the country for me for getting reports is that Kentucky, Indiana, Illinois area where it all meets down there. Yeah, I, I think that a lot of people fantasize that because it's Illinois, it's like Chicago. But the southern Illinois rural part uh, has little pockets where there's giant snake reports, uh, black panthers, uh, smaller sized uh, ape-like creatures. Uh, as you were telling your lead-off uh, investigation, uh, it went through my mind that it's really different. You know, Pacific Northwest is pristine Bigfoot country. You kind of get used to the fact that the native folks and, uh, you know, the investigators like you guys are going to run into certain things up there, um, the neo-giants as we call them. Uh, but all over the south and especially the upper, the upper part of the south, the lower Midwest, it's really rural. It's really woodsy. Um, and you can get lots of people lost in those, too. I mean, I, I don't need to go into the 411 fantasies 
but it actually just does happen. The people disappear there all the time. Yeah, weird stuff happens there quite a bit and weird things are seen. Uh, I think I probably told you, Lorna, but maybe I, I don't know if I have or not. It's just, you know, I just turned 50, so my memory is failing all the time now. But um, I saw a Black Panther in Southern Illinois while filming, while filming Finding Bigfoot, oddly enough. And I was so happy and thrilled and at the same time disappointed that I'm looking for Sasquatches and I see a Black Panther instead. That's where I saw my only Black Panther, uh, in, in southern Illinois, in the Shawnee National Forest. Uh, I was coming back from uh, a job at the Ellen, at Anna State Hospital, and we went over a rise. There was five of us squeezed in a Carmen Ghia, those little Volkswagens, and there it was, crossing the road. Black Panther. Black Panthers aren't supposed to exist in North America, and there was one. I saw one uh, in the Bald Hills coming back from Bluff Creek, and it was broad daylight, and it walked right in the road in front of us. And there was no way it was a melanistic jaguar. I mean, it was a total, complete mountain lion, but it was black. Yeah, I think they exist. Uh, statistically, 40% of all mystery cat sightings in North America are black melanistic. Uh aren't supposed to exist, but there they are. But there's no hides. There's no one's got a stuffed one. There's not even like really good video of one. No, there's one very suspicious photograph from Brazil of a black panther, but it, it may be um, a emaciated jaguar. Lauren, have you had the uh, opportunity to observe any other cryptids in your journeys through the decades? I had some near Bigfoot experiences in other places in Illinois, but I wouldn't say I feel comfortable saying they were sightings um, because uh, they were smells, um, you know, noises, brushing of, of vegetation, but nothing like that. There's, you know, been some bird sightings because I certainly know that there's a Thunderbird sighting some places no, those were in New England, uh, but um, not really, no. Well, Lauren, let's do this. This is something I like to do with uh, cryptozoologists, uh, you know, or generalists, I guess, when they come on the show. Why don't we give you a cryptid and you give us your thoughts? Like, do these exist? Do these not exist? What maybe what's the best evidence or whatever your thoughts are on it, you know, Um Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll go, we'll, we'll start easy, okay? Um, Yeti, we'll start with, we'll throw you a softball first before we, we get to the more strange things. Yeti, what are your thoughts or do you think these things are real or et cetera? Yeti may be one of the hardest cryptids to really, for me to talk about. Uh, Yetis are the ones that got me into the field. And I'm often asked by reporters, what is your favorite cryptid? And I always say, well, do you have a first love? Yeti's my first love. So I put a lot of thinking about Yetis. And I, I really do consider that they're the one cryptid, the one hominid that may have already become extinct. Uh, I think that they actually existed in the recent past. I think that uh, people can still look for them and they come across for footprints occasionally. So there may be a a small relic population of them, but uh, most people tend to know that the expeditions are not well funded into the Himalayas any longer. So I think we're losing uh, any chance to capture one, um, let alone observe it long term. Okay, Bobo, you want to throw one at him? Uh, how about the Mongolian death worm? That's a good story. I must say that. Uh, uh, trimmers, in many ways, ran with the death worm, so to speak. But I don't think there's anything large enough to swallow a camel. So I'd say the death worm has been exaggerated. There's probably some new species of reptile uh, in certain areas of the Gobi Desert, but nothing that's large is as fantastic as, as we're to believe. Okay, how about Michele Mabembe or any of the other sauropods in, you know, the uh, tropical equatorial Africa? Well, here's where my uh, hair splitting really comes into being. 
uh, Mokile Mabenbe and the other uh, seropod-like uh, reports are probably all aquatic rhinos, rhinoceros, uh, mammals. Uh, I don't think any of them are seropods, dinosaurs or whatever else you want to... It's kind of like the Loch Ness Monster. I've never uh, considered it a plesiosaur. I think all of those explanations from 65 million years ago just do not wash with me. Uh, the same kind of uh, experience from the native folks, from the footprints, from the occasional Europeans and Americans that go over there, those can all be explained by mammals by mammals that are not known yet. Oh, you know, I was going to ask you about, I know that you're big on this, is the Thunderbirds. Do you think there's more than one type, or do you think they're actually like a physical breeding population, or what's your take on that? I think that there's um, a, definitely a group of them, uh, some of the, the Rockies. There seems to be two regional populations, uh, one in the Rockies in the West. Uh, they're very high up. And then the bald mountains of uh, the Appalachia uh, really are associated with the nests of the Thunderbirds. I think a lot of local people, regional names really come out, uh, like Mothman and uh, you know Big Bird and, and some of those other names just may be uh, a way to hide the fact that there's uh, local populations of Thunderbirds. Although Mark Hall thought that uh, the Mothman really was uh, large owls, uh, he would call it uh, seriously, even though everybody thought it was a joke, he called this his big hoot category. Well, that's interesting. I, I took a report out here in Washington. Um, they submitted to my website uh, a number of years ago. A couple was driving in Vader, Washington, you know, like Darth Vader, but there was a town called Vader. Um, and uh, they thought they were driving. They thought they saw a stump. And, you know, I, th I thought I knew where this report was going. Is that reading? Oh, the stump's going to get up and walk away on two legs. But no, the stump, when they got closer to it and they're driving at the time, the stump spread its wings and flew and almost hit their car or the car almost hit it. It was a, some sort of owl with, you know, 10 foot wingspan sort of thing. It was a seven foot tall owl or something like that. And I said, what? I hadn't heard that before. So it's interesting that Mark Hall had already uh, kind of plumbed those depths a little bit with the, the Mothman uh, mythology, the saying that these maybe they're just giant owls of some sort. Yeah, if you actually look in his book, uh, Thunderbirds, uh, his last chapter or so in the book is, is called Big Hoot. And there's some drawings of how they use a camouflage to appear to be trees and then spread their wings and take off. So if you see, uh, I've actually published his, his drawing uh, online, but uh, I'll send that to you because it's remarkable. Your story exactly matches his theory. Or it wasn't his theory. It's what he got from East Coast stories. Stay tuned for more Bigfoot and Beyond with Cliff and Bobo. We'll be right back after these messages. What, what about a dog man? Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> dog man, I, I, I saw it and heard it coming. Uh, Linda Godfrey, another uh, investigator that I respect. I've known her and met her a lot and talked to her. I think that she created a phenomena that uh, people have actually uh, run with it, so to speak. Um, that some of her early reports, we would sit down uh, during a break at a conference and talk, and I'd say to her, but Linda, these look like Bigfoot that are on the roadside bending over eating rabbits, eating roadkill. Do you really think that they're a dog, you know, a human-sized dog? And she said, oh, yes, yes. And then I would go home and watch the video of her on some program and she was walking one of her little dogs. And I thought, oh, okay, she's got dogs on the mind. I know where that goes. So, so I, I really think that, you know, it's, it's like werewolf folklore. People know that it's out there. They can start hooking it up to what I think are misidentified Bigfoot. 
I, I never gave it any credence at all until I talked to like just so many good witnesses. I've only spoken to two good witnesses and I just hope they're not real. I hope that 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 is something truly in the paranormal that I don't have to deal with, because for me, that would fundamentally change camping. And I'm just not interested (laughs) in something like that. Well, I started hearing reports in the 70s when people up in Wisconsin and Michigan were talking about these dog like creatures near the Indian mounds. And uh, and then it almost became a a spiritual native uh, reckoning of what they were seeing. But I don't know, you know, I, I, I keep hearing them. Uh, I keep throwing out the possible misidentification. And, and now there's conferences and there's medals and there's figurines. I mean, it's just, it's become a cottage industry. Now, what about uh, um, Megalodon? Well, I, I really tend to think that if there were uh, the, the big guys out there, that half the surfing population of Australia would be decimated. <laughs> it's just, there's just too many places where, um, you know, swimmers, Hawaii, Australia, California, where you'd get lots and lots of reports. Even the, uh, the notion of finding their teeth seems to be a b- little bit of a myth that's grown into a rumor that's grown into a legend. So I don't think there's much to it. Uh, It almost feels like some people hope that some of these disastrous creatures do exist, but there's not much evidence. Yeah, I I would think we would find massive shark bites out of dead whales floating around because, you know, that white sharks are always eaten out of those things, but you'd expect to find massive bites. Now, you mentioned Australia, Lauren. Have you ever been down there? No, I've been uh, invited to uh, speak at two conferences, but it was those kinds of situation where one week before the conference they cancel, saying they get, didn't get enough registrations. So I want to go, of course. Well, it seems like that. That's just you know, uh, um, uh, like a hotbed for cryptozoology. So many things are down there. Whether you're talking about the Yowies or the were they the Junjadees? I think they're called the Brown Jacks, the small ones or the thylacines are down that part of the world, or uh, you must know Gary Opit or something. Do you know Gary Opit? Yeah, I actually did the introduction to the Yahweh book by uh, Paul Cropper and Tom he- Healy. Um, yeah, one of the best books ever written, by the way, on, in cryptozoology, in my opinion. So I, I would like to get that. That's, uh, the other country that I've been invited to, and then uh, I didn't cancel out, but they, the funding dropped out was in the 80s, I was supposed to go to Japan a couple times because um, mystery magazine Mew actually bought the rights and uh, reprinted about uh, 15 of my chapters from Mysterious America. They're very, very interested in cryptozoology. And, uh, you know, the, the movies uh, really overlap with a lot of cryptozoological creatures. Japan that has some wild areas as well. Everybody thinks about uh, Japan as like Tokyo, where there's you know 50 people per square yard, but um, it's just not like that in a lot of the country. There are some wild areas left. We're all familiar with reports of hairy hominoids worldwide, whether it's the Yowie in Australia, the Yeren of China, um, any number of names up in Russia and throughout that area. Uh, but you know, there's 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 um, there's a hole in the data, shall we say, and. It's only now beginning to be filled a little bit. Uh, what can you tell us about hairy hominoids and Bigfoot-like critters in Africa? Oh, I don't think there's any hole there. I think it's... Uh, well, in the literature, I think there is. Not a lot of people have written about it beyond like Sanderson. Well, Hoivelmans and Sanderson certainly tried to put something in that hole. But the other thing is that the use of the word Bigfoot has become worldwide. So... You have to look before that. You have to look for these stories of, uh, you know, there was this one woman whose name, you know, escapes me, but she wrote a lot about Creature X uh, and all of these stories from sub-Sahara Africa. Uh, There's these creatures that are kind of a different ape, uh, not a gorilla, not a chimpanzee that seems to be there, not a Bigfoot. Uh, and it's now people are paying attention to it. 
There was so many cryptids in Africa. Weibelmans systematically uh, started going through, you know, the dinosaur-like ones, the the big unknown cats, the um, you know, the dotty bear, uh, which is a big creature that may be a bear or may not be. Uh, there was so many that in Hoiberman's book on the track of unknown animals, he says towards the end of that book, I'm not even going to deal with hominids because there was so many other things he had to deal with. And, and that was reflected in his series of individual books in French. Uh, so I think that um, it's the, all the different languages in Africa has confused the picture. If you are well read in French and German, you can find hairy hominids. Not that many books in English have brought that material into our language. We had uh, uh, Patterson from Gareth Patterson. Yeah, from you. South Africa. Are you familiar with him and the Otang? No, no, I'm not. Oh, you might want to be, Lorna. Uh, I will, uh, sure. Yeah, uh, he kind of came on our radar through Matt Pruitt, actually, who had read his, uh, basically the long and short of his Gareth Patterson, who we had on the um, podcast here. Um, he was an elephant researcher. In fact, Lauren, um, you remember Born Free from the 70s, right? Yeah, um, I forget that guy's name, but Gareth was his assistant. So he, he, he was involved in all of that. And he had a big hand in lion conservation for a long time. And he eventually started studying elephants. But along the way he started seeing hairy hominoids. Um, and this is guys, uh, he's a world renowned sort of naturalist. Um, it'd be like if Jane Goodall saw four or five of these things over a five or six year period. Yeah. yeah. So they're probably some sort of Austral, like big Australopithecine or something, but they range between five and seven feet. Really interesting book um, called uh, beyond the lives of secret elephants, I believe is what it's called. Yeah, it's, it's only on Kindle, I think, at this point. I don't think there's a hardback or, you know, even a softback, uh, a physical copy of it uh, available in America because it's through some South African publisher or something, I believe. One of my sons, who uh, works for CBS Sports Network, actually uh, is getting quite a connection to Africa. He's been to Africa three times as a uh, volunteer researcher on African hunting dogs in which he tracks them and stuff. So uh, I'll talk to him because he goes to South Africa rather routinely. He can do field research for me. Oh, yeah, maybe pick up some copies of the book as well. Yeah, yeah. What do you think is the most uh, for sure physical breeding population of cryptid animals in the uh, – like Sasquatch is probably in there. And what would be their top two? Well, I wrote the book uh, with Patrick Weege called The Field Guide to Bigfoot. And in there, we uh, rated what we called the best best bets for discovery. And the number one is a Rang Pindic. I really sense that there's enough evidence of a Rang Pindic out there, enough good sightings by scientists, by biologists, that it's only a matter of time. And, and I think in many ways, discovering Homo forensis and the little creatures they um, discovered fossil forms on the Philippines shows us that there's, uh, you know, like the Minahuni in Hawaii, those kinds of tales may have a basis in fact. Uh, there's a Rang Pindek will be discovered, um, maybe not in my lifetime, but certainly in you guys' lifetime. Uh, it's just around the corner. Yeah, it was really exciting that uh, the new human species, Homo luzonensis, um, from uh, the Philippines that you just referred to, uh, another diminutive sort of uh, dwarf-like human uh, relative, I should say, not ancestor necessarily, but relative. Um, it's an exciting news. And it, what an amazing time for cryptozoology, just like the last 30 years. Um, all these new species of our own lineage being discovered throughout the world through new techniques as well. Like uh, um, Homo Denisovan, for example, uh, discovered through DNA. And then what happens is that they start digging through museum collections and say, oh, wait, this is one of those. And we've had it since 1984. Uh, it's an exciting time for a uh, discovery in uh, sort of hominid studies, I suppose, you know, crypto hominid studies. I'm still holding out the possibility, you know, a few years ago, they were 
looking in a cave in the Himalayas and they found a skull, the llamas did. And that's in the collections now, it's in, under study. And they don't think it's human. Uh, they wonder if it's possibly a Sasonian or a Yeti. You know, so there may be something already that we have uh, like that. And the the little creature from the Flores, you know, Homo forensis, um, I was able to get the first replica in the United States uh, for our museum when uh, I think it was a, a tech show on like MTV type channel. They wanted me to appear with it and talk about it. So I was able to get that replica and then take it home to the museum. I'm now hoping that uh, you and I can get the first ones of the, the little creatures they found in uh, Indonesia, in the Philippines. Yeah, Luzonensis. I, I'm not sure that those are available. I know you can get the Homo floresiensis stuff. I think you can get it on Bones clones and all those sort of fossil replica places now. We should be able to get the other replicas soon. Yeah, yeah, exciting times. And of course, uh, I imagine most of our listeners are, they either know or should know that on the same island where Homo floresiensis was discovered, there are um, to this day stories about small, hair covered, human like things called Ibu Gogo. No relation to Bobo, by the way. No, no it's not Ibu Bobo. <laughs> Third cousin. <laughs> I don't know. Bobo's far too large for that. <laughs> What are your best-selling books, Lauren? Uh, Cryptozoology A to Z, which came out from Simon & Schuster in 1999. is still in print. It's in its 14th printing and going strong. I had to fight them a few years ago uh, to keep it in print. They wanted to have it go all electronic. But I need physical copies for the uh, museum bookstore. So I won that battle, but I... I sometimes get pretty upset seeing all these books going to ebooks, but uh, yeah, cryptozoology A to Z followed closely behind with uh, Bigfoot: The True Story of Apes in America, which is from two thousand three. I sell a lot of those books in the museum store here because it really is, I think, the best overview of the historical Bigfoot stuff from the beginning to now. It, it's a great book, and a lot of people really. Uh, it, it re resonates with a lot of people. The book that I wish more people would buy would be my uh, Tom Slick book, because I wrote that book like an academic uh, thesis in which I uh, cite everything that I put in it page by page. I used uh, my old anthropology citation model, and it's got extensive footnotes, extensive history about uh, Tom Page and Tom Slick, and uh, I really like it uh, the best because it gives a whole history of the how the infighting started in the Pacific Northwest with, you know, guys like Ed Patrick and uh, you know Ray Wallace uh, jockeying to see who would get the most amount of money out of Tom Slick that anybody could. So I, I love that book. That was an excellent book. And that is probably my favorite book that you've written as well, Lauren. And in, in fact, it, uh, it, it boils my curds that when people talk about the Yeti and they say, no, I've never read it, you know, like, or uh, there's two books actually about Tom Slick and the Yeti that you've written, I believe. Am I, am I correct? Or is my memory fading again? No, they're different editions with different appendices. Is that what it is? Yeah. When people talk about uh, being interested in the Yeti and, oh, I love the Yeti, but they hadn't read those books. It just makes me roll my eyes and just say, holy crap, you need to do some homework before, you know, or, or treat yourself. You know, it's like an ice cream cone. Treat yourself to these books. They have the best information about that time and those expeditions that you can find anywhere. Well, you know, with that, I, I, I guess it's probably time to shut down the podcast for this week. I'll, although I think we could probably talk for a few more hours. Uh, Lauren, is, you are such a wealth of knowledge and experience. You've met everybody there is pretty much and have experience with pretty much everybody in cryptozoology. Oh, I see your dogs are trying to get us to go, too. So uh, I'll just go ahead and take that as a sign. And um, thank you for coming on the podcast with Bobo and I. We really, really appreciate it. It's been great, guys. I, I loved being on here with you, too. 
Yeah, thanks, Lauren. I really appreciate the time. And yeah, for those listening, Lauren's got a ton of books. Check them out online. I recommend them. And that Tom Slick book, you, uh, that is my favorite one of yours also. That's a great book. Even if you're not in a Bigfoot Yeti, it's still a great read. And of course, if you're in the, that corner of the United States, you know, up, up by Maine, anywhere up there, like five, six, ten hours away, make the trek. Make the trek to the International Cryptozoology Museum. It, it's it's unlike anywhere else. I mean, when I go through there, and I've been there three or four times now, I think, um, I, my jaw drops with the kind of stuff that Lauren has. I mean, imagine collecting anything for half a century or more. You're going to have a lot of really rad stuff in there. You know, when you see the flag from Sir Ed, Ed, Edmund Hillary's expeditions to the Himalayas, we, all of these one-of-a-kind artifacts from the history of the subject that we love more than anything. It's jaw-dropping. So, by God, get down to the International Cryptozoology Museum. If you can't get there in person, well, support them by buying something in their online store, uh, buy Lauren's books, do anything you can because the museums like Lauren's have to have to survive. Nothing else serves their role in our society. Um, by all means, do everything you can. And Lauren's is nonprofit. It, 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 it's, it's great. I can't say enough good things about it. So get down there if you can. Check it out for yourself. You will not be disappointed. So with that, Lauren, thank you so much for coming on. And uh, I look forward to the next time we have a chance to talk. Okay. Click. Take it easy. Bye. Later, Lauren. All right, Bobes. Another one for the history book. You know, anytime you get Lauren on a show, you're, 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 you're taking a peek into the history of cryptozoology in general, because there's very few people that have been doing it. I don't, I can't think of anyone who's been doing it as long as Lauren has been. Um, and he's, like I said, he's met everybody. He's, he knows a little bit about everything. Now you could talk about a cryptozoology generalist. Um, but when, I mean, don't think it's surface knowledge. That guy has deep knowledge about all of these sort of animals. Oh yeah. He, he's, uh, the top guy. I mean, he might not have been to like all those places in person, but he's talked to all the people that have, and there's no one else like him. I mean, he's the most prolific writer on the subject by far. I mean, he's the godfather. Yeah. He, he's the elder statesman in cryptozoology today. Um, yeah. I can't say enough nice things about him. Yeah, that was great. Well, man, we're going to have a tough time topping, uh, getting a guess that good for next week, but we guess we got to try. Yeah, I'll do my best and you do your best too. We'll see who we get. Okay. All right, folks. Well, thanks for tuning in. Like Cliff said, check out uh, the International Cryptozoology Museum in Portland, Maine. If you get the chance, Lauren runs up there with his wife, Jen, and check out his books. They're great. You can get a lot of, a lot of information. So check them out. And until next time, keep it squatchy. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Bigfoot and Beyond. If you liked what you heard, please rate and review us on iTunes. Subscribe to Bigfoot and Beyond wherever you get your podcasts and follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Bigfoot and Beyond Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at Bigfoot and Beyond. That's an N in the middle. And tweet us your thoughts and questions with the hashtag Bigfoot and Beyond. 